Hi there, this is Alvin and welcome to the Kickstart Commerce Podcast, where we share search marketing and domain investing strategies to help grow your business. In today's episode, our guest is none other than Rob Monster, a serial entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Epic, an innovative domain registrar and web hosting company. Today, Rob and I discuss a number of items. We dive into his background and journey into the domain industry. We also talk about a few of the sites that they've developed, like nameliquidate.com, prayermeeting.com. And we also dive into a few of their services, such as Epic Escrow, Epic Labs. And we also get to hear from Rob um, on the next line of innovative Epic services. And last but not least, we talk about how COVID has impacted Epic. So with that, Rob, Welcome, and thank you for making time to join us today. Thanks, Alvin. Delighted to be here. Certainly. So to kick things off, Rob, I want you to briefly share with the listeners a bit about yourself, who you are, your professional and personal background. Yeah. uh, So, Alvin, I've uh, had maybe a little bit of an unusual journey, uh, but so many people that you encounter in the domain industry have their own unique journeys. Nobody grows up uh, saying, I want to be a domainer when I grow up. Um, (laughs) And uh, you know, in my case, that was that was certainly so. Um, I grew up uh, Dutch American, uh, splitting time between the U.S. and the Netherlands. Uh, started my uh, career uh, at Procter and Gamble after getting an undergrad and MBA from uh, Cornell, and uh, was uh, for nine years at P&G, uh, first in Germany for four years, and then Japan for five years, and then um, uh, moved to uh, Seattle in 1999. Uh, to start uh, my first startup, which was Global Market Insights, sold to WPP Group for nine figures cash. Uh, was then a, a private equity investor, full-time for a couple of years, and uh, then uh, began getting more acquainted uh, with um, uh, domain names as, a, as an asset class. And uh, out of that journey uh, was born uh, the initial idea of of what is now known as Epic. Uh, you know, we have been doing um, domain names as an asset class as a theme. It started out as a bit of a lifestyle business for me, as I was spending a lot of time indulging all kinds of hobbies. Uh, <laughs> but about the year and a half ago, um, in um, the summer of 2018, um, I had an unction to really uh, focus full time on turning Epic into what it can be uh, and to really apply time, talent, and treasure with full vigor uh, with the objective of creating a world transforming company. So many people have known Epic over the years, mostly as uh, a business that was active in providing solutions for demeaning uh, to a relatively uh, small circle of customers, about 80,000 customer accounts worldwide, uh, but not as an industry transforming uh, a participant in the domain economy and the, and the underlying ecosystem that powers it. And uh, so now, uh, as of about a year and a half ago, you, you begin to see this acceleration, and that is a direct result of really that conscious decision to set the other projects aside and to make Epic the focus. Nice, nice. So, I mean, you have a pretty uh, broad background then in terms of your breadth of experience. I do. I've been uh, obviously a, a corporate guy. I've been a startup guy. I've been an angel investor, a private equity investor. I've served on many boards. Uh, I've, I've uh, done a service as an interim CEO of a public company. Um, and I've traveled all over the world, uh, speak uh, four languages and lived, in, uh, on, four, lived on four continents, um, have been all over the world. I think uh, racked up one million air miles in a single year. In wow. 1998. Uh, so to say that I was at one point a world uh, traveler would not be an overstatement. <laughs> that is awesome. So then in terms of like domain investing, so have you ever been, I guess, consider yourself a domain investor or developer or what, you know, kind of how do you see that, that picture? Um, so really, I, I've long thought that the internet would ultimately play a, a massive role um, in economic and social transformation as the world would become progressively digital. And we'll probably talk later about uh, the, the circumstances related to COVID. But I think what that's doing is accelerating something that we all saw uh, unfolding long before, uh, which is the idea that uh, the internet and that domain names as an addressing schema for participating with branded identity on the internet would ultimately become as important or maybe even more important than commercial real estate in the physical realm. 
And I think that when we look at the way things are unfolding, that may indeed be exactly what is playing out here and now in this present uh, time of 2020, which happens to be an election year and we happen to be living you know, in life under COVID. Gotcha. Gotcha. So then kind of diving into Epic services then. So what separates Epic, you know, let's say what separates you from uh, the uh, different competitors such as, let's just say GoDaddy? Well, we have an approach that is really about the intersection of, let's say, private banking uh, with uh, the function of, say, a registrar. We are full service, all inclusive and no nonsense. Right. So one stop shop for helping uh, somebody try to learn how to be effective in the digital realm, uh, to have essentially a single partner that they can work with to pretty much function as their virtual IT department. So we're not just a registrar and a host. If you actually look at the full stack of what it is that we have assembled uh, through organic development and also through partnership and acquisition, we're actually, I believe, unique in that we have assembled under one roof uh, registry, registrar, hosting, uh, uh, DNS provisioning, um, content delivery network, denial of service mitigation, um, and a VPN all in one. And then moreover added to that, the ability to do full service marketing of entire digital brands. And you'll see more of that in the coming months as uh, some of the featured properties that we have secured uh, exclusive representation for. Uh, are marketed to retail end users. So if you think about uh, domain names as a continuum, where uh, the domain name is maybe the seed of a, of a digital venture, uh, our objective is to essentially empower the entire journey of acquire, build, manage, sell for the digital venture that is basically represented by a domain name that has also other ancillary features. So then you're not strictly focused then on domain investors per se. Oh, not at all. I think domain names uh, are predominantly owned by uh, domain investors. And so we view the domain investor as, a, as really a, a supply chain partner. And our mandate is to help that domain name investor realize the full potential of their proven and also their untapped reserves. Uh, so if I, if I use uh, an oil discovery metaphor, you have this idea of what it is that you know, which is, let's say, there is a retail value. Uh, for a uh, for a domain name, a one word uh, domain name, you could probably get a bunch of people together and say, "Okay, how much would that be worth?" And they may say, "Well, that name is worth a hundred thousand uh, dollars." On the other hand, if you take that domain name and then envision it as being a turnkey digital brand, where there is some combination of other ancillary features that have been appended to that name, or there is a business concept that is appended to that name, you have a very different equation. And uh, names that you might say would otherwise go for 100,000 now become $2 million digital brands. And so we see tremendous potential there. And you'll uh, see uh, some news about our current representation of 3D.com, uh, bra.com, um, slideshow.com, uh, patents.com. Um, these are all examples of uh, digital brands that have some larger story that can be told to a would-be strategic buyer who is evaluating their present circumstance in an environment where they have to become a whole lot more digital than they were a year ago. Interesting. So then, from a, a domain so from a domain investors, uh, you know, perspective. So let's say, you know, for instance, if if I have domain names, I'm listing them on, let's say, After Nick, GoDaddy. In most cases. I either, if it's through After Nick, I kind of got to wait on After Nick to do their thing. Um, or if I have a domain that's listed and someone approaches me, then I go over to escrow. I got to do escrow.com, go through that. Um, I mean, kind of compare processes there of, you know, what makes Epic, uh, I guess, stand head and shoulders above the rest in terms of your escrow services. Well, I mean, we've really looked at it as being an integrated a framework for being able to mitigate counterparty risk. So if you think about a typical transaction that would exist between a buyer and a seller, where you also introduce, let's say, um, an escrow agent, a broker, uh, and then maybe even a domain lender, uh, think about how many counterparties are involved in that transaction. Uh, with, with Epic, it would in theory be possible to collapse that down to just buyer-seller 
uh, and, and then Epic uh, as being the, essentially the counterparty. Now, there may be a broker that is involved in that deal, but from a buy side standpoint and a sell side standpoint, you mitigate the risk by essentially creating one counterparty. There's a counterparty for the buyer and the counterparty for the seller, and that's Epic. So from a, from a risk mitigation standpoint, we take on the fiduciary duty to vet uh, the buyer and vet the seller. Think about the number of transactions that occur where there's maybe a footnote next to it where you wonder whether that domain name has free and clear title. So when we make that evaluation of whether or not that, that, that domain name is free and clear to be transacted, we're also taking on the responsibility of evaluating whether that domain name is indeed free and clear, right? So it helps tremendously to be a registrar because you obviously can take physical delivery of that domain name into uh, actual registrar control, but it also helps from the standpoint of having forensic competencies in terms of understanding the history of that domain name. One of the projects uh, that we've been incubating is a project called dnprotect.com. Uh, dnprotect.com is a domain name insurance platform, but behind the scenes with that is the idea of a so-called DNP score, uh, where we are essentially scoring similar to the way you would say do uh, credit risk. We do essentially a risk assessment as to whether or not that domain name would likely have problems down the road, uh, whether it would be uh, at risk for UDRP or at risk for being, for being fail listed or at risk uh, for uh, being caught in spam filters and so forth and so on. Interesting. So then you could take something like a Kickstart Commerce and Kickstart Commerce likely has a score that's based on, I'm assuming, probably age of domain, probably number of backlinks, probably yeah. some different criteria that I would have, that I would imagine uh, that you've built into this DN yeah. Protect product. If you go to dnprotect.com, you can check it out. Uh, it's about 24 different vectors uh, uh, that we evaluate. And that's actually a free service. Um, uh, we don't charge for generating the score. Um, and I think people will find it actually to be very useful as a diagnostic tool uh, to detect whether or not there might be risk factors hidden in their domain name. The algorithm for the DN Protect scoring system, the so-called DNP score, uh, was developed in cooperation with the fellow you, I think you know, Bill Hartzer, uh, yeah. who has been a longtime uh, thought leader around uh, risk mitigation and around SEO. And so uh, Bill approached me uh, in um, late 2019 uh, about what did I think about the idea of developing a, a risk scoring system for domain names. And I said, well, that, that's fascinating, Bill, uh, but what's the, what's the business model? In other words, you know, creating a score is all very fascinating, but there needs to be a business model. Right. And I said, I said, what the industry really needs is uh, domain insurance. And the idea that we would create essentially a um, domain insurance product that would basically sit outside conventional cyber liability, which doesn't cover by domains. You know, if you, if you, if you go and look into a typical cyber liability policy, uh, there's no reference to domains. So if your domain goes missing or you lose it in UDRP, you're out of luck. Interesting. And that's both. And so you're really helping both the buyer and seller, uh, probably right. from different perspectives. Yeah, this is just a natural outgrowth of, of being essentially an industry observer that has access to a tremendous amount of data. Uh, we are also incubating a product called WhoQ, uh, which is a, a who is a, a replacement in an environment when many of the different uh, registrars are eliminating the who is data set entirely due to GDPR compliance right. or due to other uh, policy around, around privacy. Or maybe they just don't want to make it too easy for potential buyers of domains to get a hold of registrants. Whatever the motivation is, who is is being essentially eviscerated. And that's a problem. And so we said, well, what can we do to solve that problem? And so WhoQ was incubated as a project to essentially empower registrants to be able to verify their ownership of a domain name and then basically set policy that says, hey, come and reach me. I'm, I'm available to be contacted. If you would like to know about my domain name, you can contact me. So we don't have to guess about who is the present owner of the domain name. We can actually know who's the present owner of the domain name and verify that they're the owner of that domain name in a way that is registrar agnostic, which is quite unusual, right? Most registrars are looking in a very siloed way from the perspective of, I got mine. Uh, we've said, that's not really what's going to win the battle for the industry. We have to focus on strategies to make the pie bigger for everybody. And then we'll take our slice. 
But if we make the pie bigger for everybody and we empower a much larger pool of potential people uh, to be able to participate and not lose their shirts because they basically got defrauded in a bogus transaction or because they couldn't sell the dream because nobody could get a hold of them because the WHOIS record was obscured or their landing pages didn't resolve, uh, you know, and so forth and so on. And so we can take all of these best practices, distill them down into a platform, introduce some basic artificial intelligence or at least model best practices that are essentially programmatically delivered. And now all of a sudden, an amateur domain investor can become a regionally capable uh, domain investor. And we went even so far as to incubate uh, a, a project called domaingraduate.com where we acquired an existing online course about how to be a successful domain investor from a guy you might have come across, Sean Stafford. And we then retooled that course and we made it free. And now it's available in multiple languages. And so if you're wondering why all of a sudden there are a lot more guys from Nigeria and Bangladesh participating in domain investing, it's probably because they got a hold of a domain graduate course or they attended one of the actual in-person training events uh, and they are actually learning how to be successful domain investors. And they're having tremendous success. You take a guy uh, where a typical uh, middle-class income is, let's say, $200 a month or $250 a month, and you show them how to buy a name for 5 bucks or 10 bucks and sell it for $250, 500 or 1000 or 5000 you're talking about a completely different ballgame, life-transforming stuff. Certainly, and I mean, and that's, uh, that's something that in most cases that if you are um, a Western domainer who has to depend on, you know, domain um, selling as your primary source, or even a secondary source of income, in most cases, you're not touching those domains that fall below that $500, uh, sometimes even that $250 mark. Um, yeah, but like you said, right. if, if you have someone who um, is in yet another country, I mean, that is pretty much equivalent to sometimes a month, if not, a, if not more than, you know, a living wage. We're seeing it all day long. Uh, and, and the funny part is that a number of these transactions also require uh, a phone follow-up. Somebody says, um, let's say, losangelespianomovers.com for $850 um, a couple of days ago. Uh, and the buyer said, well, I need a phone call. And uh, the Nigerian seller was not prepared to make that phone call. And they said, hey, Rob, would you make that phone call? So I made that phone call. And, you know, the domain was sold about an hour later, right? And so the point is that uh, when we function in our, in our capacity as a digital empowerment platform, we have to look at things holistically from the perspective of what it is that we can do for that, re for that registrant to help them to succeed. And sometimes it means we make a tidy margin. And sometimes we may have to do it for free. And every now and then, we may even have to take a loss-making relationship uh, at the outset in order to give that person a bootstrap. Uh, that's where things like uh, domains at cost or domains below cost or uh, interest-free domain loans, uh, th those things come in not because they make money in the short run. No, uh, they, they come in because they create value in the long run and we get to participate. Let's talk a little bit about the why and how you're able, or rather Epic is able to be so nimble to, I mean, you've, you've listed just in our time together, uh, Domain Graduate, um, what else? You listed a couple other services, DN Protect. Yeah. How is it that Epic is so able to move so nimble so quick versus some of the uh, bigger competition? Well, I mean, um, I actually have had a lot of history in working with software and leading development projects, uh, even at uh, P&G. I was a product management uh, person. I was global product manager for the Pampers brand of baby diapers uh, and was working with software since I was a youth. My father was a professor of computer science. Uh, so I, I grew up with computers from a very early age and, and have used them throughout uh, my professional life. But uh, what is unique about that, as a guy who spent time in, in brand development and has, has spent time in uh, leading commercial ventures, but also has a fascination with tech, is I get to work with really bright engineers and I understand the challenges that they're facing. And so we can make fairly informed decisions uh, in a nimble way around how will these different components of an ecosystem ultimately interplay but also how do we essentially manage the cost benefit equation 
so that the things that we work on have the maximum amount of impact. And you, you will see over the com coming year some really fascinating developments, uh, of many more than I have listed so far, in, in, that, I, that I see solving important problems where they provide asymmetric value uh, at the relatively modest cost of development. And that's what, that is what excites me. Uh, but I think the other main driving factor that is, of course, making all of this possible is we've been enormously blessed, Alvin, with uh, very talented, passionate people who work hard and don't care too much about who gets the credit. And you'll be amazed when you assemble a diverse group of people from around the world and you create an environment where they actually enjoy working with their colleagues um, and, and, and don't have a mindset of uh, scarcity. When you have a politically charged organization, oftentimes that is a result of that organization being filled with people who are wondering if their budget is going to get approved or if they're going to get a raise and whatever, whatever. Uh, that's a scarcity mindset. If you take the mindset that says, we can co-create abundance by doing all of these developments and create a value proposition where there's so much value being created that there's plenty of opportunity for shared gain, uh, all of a sudden you can, you can unleash the uh, innovative capacity of a much larger organization. And I think uh, one of uh, the talents that I have developed over the years is figuring out uh, uh, what are the strengths of each individual and how do you play to their strengths while at the same time allowing them to basically not be uh, um, bored or distracted with the things that they don't enjoy. And so you can create an environment where literal roles and projects are built around the individual because you discover that they have some gift. And one of the things that I have uh, con been convinced of over the years is that we all have gifts. We all have talents. These are God-given gifts and talents. And if we allow people to play to those strengths and leverage those gifts and, and create an environment where they get to basically work together with people who have different gifts, I, I think we become quite amazed at what is possible. Man, that is that is truly amazing, and I think you you know you're right. If if you were to put someone who wasn't necessarily gifted or they didn't have the passion for a certain project, it's likely going to take them longer if, if they ever get it done. Uh, but then if they do get it done, it's probably not the best best representation of their work that they could have produced uh, just because they're not aligned. So, you know, I certainly agree. And I think that that is, uh, you have certainly, you know, hit up on something there to have put together a talented group of individuals um, that really care about what they do and care about what they deliver um, and do it in such a way that, uh, you know, it's like I, I, I follow Twitter and I can see people. Matter of fact, I posted something the other day about, having a couple of domains listed on uh, dan.com and some of the landers are basically some of the inquiries that were coming in their buyers they make an inquiry and you know we go back and forth and then we settle on a price agree to that price and then they just ghost mm. um and you know <laughs> You know, as a, as a seller, I never hear again from the buyer. I'm relying on Dan, you know, to uh, basically, you know, at least track down the person. Um, and in the midst of this Twitter exchange there, and it's, I was like, man, this seems like almost clockwork. There's someone else came in and go, you know, I use Epic Landers and I don't have this problem. Um, and it's one of those things that I just keep noticing around some of the Epic services, not even some, but all of Epic services is that, you know, you're there to provide that support. And if something's not working, you're going to ensure, you know, to the best of your ability to make sure that it's a win-win situation for both Epic as well as the customer involved. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the, the, the rule of thumb is know your product and know your customer. And so... Um, uh, we know the product. I run the engineering team every Monday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, you know, we have our all hands for the tech team. And I run that meeting. Uh, so I know what we're working on. And I, and I know the product. Uh, you know, and I can do things very quickly with that product. And, and, and I can then also spot the problems with that product. I still see the customer support transcripts of most customer interactions that occur in a given day. Now, sometimes that means parsing through a bunch of email, but the point is <laughs> that uh, I, I get to see it and it's a way to basically keep the finger on the pulse. Uh, in the past, it would be often a function of being able to take calls. I don't have the luxury of being able to do that nearly as much as I used to, 
uh, or to handle tickets. But uh, when you actually have a chance to interact with the customer and see where the pain is and can begin to alleviate that pain by developing smart software, like the example of how do you solve a ghosting problem? Well, you can write software that actually vets that prospect uh, and, and allows you to basically ascertain, is this a reliable bidder? Does this person have a pattern of essentially ghosting? Well, if they do, then you would be able to use software to say, this person has made 120 offers and has closed none of them, right? Would be a red flag for sure, right? So we can write software that basically develops countermeasures against people doing something that is really quite reasonable, which is their arbitraging value. And the software uh, of APIs allows them to do that. But if you don't develop countermeasures, uh, then you will basically find that the customer gets spam because the API gets abused. And that's not a problem that is exclusive to any particular marketplace. It's quite rampant for any marketplace that has an open API. Right? And so the second one, first one being know your product, second one, of course, is know your customer. And uh, you know, because we have actually put an emphasis and a created a cultural norm of uh, uh, empowering the organization to get to know the customer at the personal level, hiring country managers and brand ambassadors, you know, to an increasing degree, we have people on the ground who speak the language and who can interact with these customers and uh, can look at things through their lens. You know, if, if you understand the limitations around paying people in Bangladesh, then you begin to develop inventive strategies around how do you make it possible for people in Bangladesh who sell a domain to get paid. Uh, but you would never know that if you didn't have guys on the ground who explained the reality of the circumstance that they're living in. And that same pattern uh, replicates around the world where one country after the other, we're securing CCTLD registry uh, agreements and hiring country managers, hiring brand ambassadors and, and building um, uh, bench strength in providing the same level of kind of epic uh, service value and product superiority uh, that would be appropriate for that particular market. For example, China, where we are uh, growing rather quickly, uh, not just for escrow, but also we are a .cn uh, accredited registry, re registrar. Uh, and, and so we are developing uh, capability to serve uh, the China market. Well, that requires knowing that customer and their situation. And those circumstances are often quite unique. Interesting. So then kind of changing gears here in terms of, you know, because one of the things that it's it's so interesting as my mind kind of rattles or thinks through just all the things that Epic does and all the things that Epic offers. I know one of the things that has been certainly catching on um, and it's probably on fire uh, is that it's the liquidation platform. Yeah. So, you know, name liquidate. So kind of walk us through um, what that is and how it benefits domain investors. Yeah, so that project came out of a tech team meeting, uh, December 4th, 2019. Uh, Dan Sanchez had the idea that we should solve this problem. He was seeing vast numbers of domains uh, being expired on um, expiry markets, uh, such as GoDaddy, and, and knew full well and firsthand that these registrants were getting zero. And he posited the question, you know, what could we do to basically empower registrants to benefit from their own expiry stream? And would it not be possible to essentially allow people who have valid auth codes of unlocked domains to be able to essentially realize some value? And then beyond that, there are people who are from time to time in distress and they need to sell right away. There are people who from time to time decide they no longer want to have anything to do with a particular category of domain name and they'll get whatever they can get. And so they uh, put it through this uh, Dutch auction uh, where the price starts at $999 and it can drop to whatever the reserve is. The default reserve is $9, but uh, uh, mo many people set other reserves. We would encourage people to essentially let the process run. Uh, it gives you maximum visibility. And we're really thankful for uh, bloggers like Robbie's blog that have been highlighting some of the featured listings as they arrive. And we're seeing great sell-through and all of the, the statistics uh, of, of participation, of uh, daily visitors, um, new listings, very much up and to the right, right? There's a little bit of variation intraday or day-to-day, -day, but the overall trend is that Name Liquidate is turning into a really interesting 
solution to a problem that most domainers have, which is how do you make sure to monetize your expiry stream so you benefit as opposed to predominantly the registrar? So, you know, just kind of make it make sense here or, and certainly keep me honest here, Rob. So if I have domains at GoDaddy today, I let those domains expire. I don't get a dime. But if I then have domains that are actually registered or I transfer domains over to Epic, I let them expire. No no need to transfer. You can actually actually take any domain name at any registrar. As long as you have an auth code and the domain is unlocked, you can liquidate it. I don't even have to transfer it. It's there as long as I have an a, uh, auth code, and then uh, essentially it's listed on name liquidate. If it does sell, then we do, I guess, get a, a certain percentage of that pie. You get ninety-one uh, percent uh, of the proceeds from the sale, and if the domain needs to be transferred because it's expiring, the buyer pays the transfer fee, and it's done at cost. So a, a typical domain transfer for .dot com is eight dollar forty-nine. If somebody is paying with, with um, wire transfer uh, or crypto where they pre-fund their account, it is as little as $8.10 or allinclusive.com. Interesting. So then, Rob, the big question here, why has it taken so long to get to this point in time in the industry to offer such a service? Not necessarily targeting name, you know, Epic, but I'm just going, okay, or name liquidate at that matter, but it's really going, why hasn't this surface, you know, before now? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating question because it's one of these things that in retrospect is so obvious. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think that it's partially because that there is essentially a counterbalance against greed. So if you have an excessively um, draconian and onerous practice vis-a-vis trying to drive as much inventory through an expiry stream, uh, as some registrars do that I will not name, uh, then, then it's a natural response from industry participants to say, well, that doesn't seem right. What could we do about it? And so I think it's mainly that. Uh, we've, have, we've seen a pretty dramatic consolidation uh, of, of registrars over the course, over the last, let's say, 10 years. Right. Uh, and even most recently, GoDaddy acquiring Uniregistry uh, and now also acquiring Noistar, which of course has many registries. Um, you know, there is essentially a hyper concentration, um, and that, of course, is not uh, alone, right? There, there are other uh, aggressive acquirers of participants in the domain industry. And so I think there's value in preventing hyper consolidation, and there's also value in uh, creating a sort of grassroots innovation, or innovation response uh, to countermeasure against any type of market overreach. And that's what I see unfolding and that is a bit unique is that w- with Epic, we talk a lot about uh, co-creation uh, and uh, about partnering with the industry participants. We have been quite active on name pros. Uh, we're, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that we were voted Registrar of the Year. Uh, but I think partly that was because there was a dialogue. There was a real uh, authentic effort on the part of um, Epic and, and, its, and its management team uh, to cooperate with the members of the community to figure out how do we make the pie bigger, how do we create value, and how do we take all these great ideas that people have that they'll never develop? Because you know, it doesn't make sense to go create your own landing pages and your own marketplace and your own uh, escrow agent and your own registrar um, when you can basically take whatever you're great at and apply that uh, by getting essentially the ideas embedded into the platform. And if, by the way, that platform allows you to do all these additional things without charging you, great, it's a win-win. Our objective is that if it can be free, it will be free. So we provide to free domain name asset management, we provide free domain forwarding, free domain privacy. Um, you know, we, we have uh, allowed people to be able to, for example, even do free escrow. Uh, if the domain is on Epic, and the buyer pays with a wire transfer and the person is a known member of the domain investment community, such as a member of name pros that is established, we even waive escrow fees. Uh, why? Because it was a riskless transaction. So if it can be free, it will be free. And where we ultimately create value, which ultimately funds innovation and allows us to maintain a payroll, is by uh, participating on the back end, right? So when we help somebody achieve an exit and we take a 9% commission, not high, uh, for helping somebody to create 
uh, value from exiting to a retail buyer, um, that's very powerful. If we uh, partner with an organization to take a high value domain name and turn that domain name into a world-class digital brand, and that digital brand sells for millions of dollars, we've co-created value and we can participate in the exit uh, in a way that doesn't actually uh, take anything away from what that registrant was going to get otherwise. In fact, they got more. There was something that you said there that caught me way back, just probably a few words before that, which was based around, you said uh, something in the neighborhood. It, it sounded like, hey, as long as that person is a member of NamePro, so do they have to be a member of Epic or have an Epic account? Or how does that, that work out in yeah, terms of so, it being free? Yeah. Uh, so if the domain name is on Epic uh, at the start of the transaction, uh, and the buyer and or seller uh, are verified known parties, uh, we can very often do a transaction without even charging a commission, uh, provided that the buyer is paying via wire transfer. Where you get into trouble and where there is counterparty risk uh, is a situation where the domain is freshly arrived, the customer has never been in a relationship with the company before, and they pay with a credit card, and they are not able to verify their identity and they want to be paid out in Bitcoin, right? I mean, you can imagine uh, all kinds of red flags there. However, we're a small community. When it comes to the, the, the highest value domain portfolios, it's a relatively small community. And so the ability with one degree of separation to be able to say, uh, is, can, we, can we do this transaction without a commission uh, is something that is possible because so many people have a long-standing acquaintance and relationship, and so you're often one degree of separation from being able to know with confidence that this is basically a riskless transaction. And you know, um, we deal a lot uh, with emerging markets. Um, one of the markets that I'm really passionate about is Nigeria. Uh, when we first began working with Nigeria, there was lots of commentary about how. Nigeria is the home of fraud or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, we have not had a single problem with anybody in Nigeria, uh, with one exception. And that guy was not the Nigerian. He had the Nigerian address, but he was not the Nigerian. Uh, and we have had no, tra no transactional challenges. And so I would just encourage your listeners uh, to do your best to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, to treat everybody as individual, and to not buy into the stereotypes because there has been weaponized propaganda that has essentially been used to essentially destroy economies and to disempower people that have every bit of equal ability to create value. And when you essentially turn those opportunities away, you narrow your opportunities and you restrict your options. And I would say that uh, there's tremendous potential in taking the relatively underappreciated uh, economic participant and, and help that party to realize the potential and you will find them to be both honorable and, 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 and very important, also very grateful. Uh, and uh, when you create value for them, that uh, is often returned in one favor or another, but you just don't know when. Got it. No, and that, and that is something uh, certainly in terms of, because like I said, I mean, you're, you're, you're viewing and not only viewing, but you're actually bringing Epic to the point of being a, a global company. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, from, from the outset, uh, we, we were uh, already geographically distributed and we were already uh, not headquarter centric. We had people walking from wherever they were, uh, all connected through secure VPN long before COVID made that a thing. Right. So when, when that <laughs> blew through, uh, uh, that didn't really affect us because it was already part of our cultural norm and we didn't have the burden of a uh, $45 per square foot floor plate and any of this other uh, traditional overhead that was in, you know, causing unneeded expense. So really from the standpoint of being uh, you know, internationally capable and being able to like, readily onboard the, the best and the brightest wherever we could find them, uh, that has been essentially a central port, a portion of our uh, DNA since the beginning. And when you actually look at these all hands meetings that we conduct both for the engineering team and for customer success team, uh, it's 
really uh, just a wonderfully diverse group of people from all over the world. And unfortunately, sometimes the Asians have to stay up late. Uh, and, and so maybe that's a bit of a downside, but on balance, because we only do it once a week, uh, you know, we, we have a, a great opportunity to bring the group together, but all throughout the week, we're using a uh, group where like um, Slack um, and uh, Mattermost and um, of course Skype and our own proprietary software, as well as, you know, ticketing systems uh, like uh, Jira and Redmine uh, to basically allow people to walk seamlessly across borders. Um, and we've even uh, incubated some of these solutions from the ground up. We used Zendesk for a long, long time at a as a ticketing system, but are now introducing our own uh, ticketing system called customersupport.co that uh, doesn't have a seat fee. Uh, for people who use a lot of customer support software, uh, the cost mounts rather quickly when you add hundreds and hundreds of seats. Um, and so it penalizes people who don't have a ready ability to participate um, at scale just due to the fixed price of uh, a price per seat. So we can solve these challenges both for ourselves, but also for people who have similar problems. Interesting. So is that is, uh, you said it was customer support.co? .co, yeah. So is that its own company? It's its own venture. And, and okay. as you look at Epic Labs, you will see uh, quite a catalog of uh, projects that <laughs> we have incubated or that we have acquired, right? So we did four acquisitions last year. Uh, and so when we look at uh, a, a, an opportunity, uh, we're looking at it from the perspective of what problem does it solve and does it scale? Uh, we tend to focus on things that scale hmm. where there's some network effect, right? And where there's some framework for interoperability that will ultimately improve people's lives. You know, one of the things that you will see uh, roll out here in the coming weeks is a single sign-on framework uh, called Federated Identity. Um, that is our product. It is uh, based on um, best of breed uh, single sign on technology uh, for allowing people to essentially log on once and now have seamless ability to use all of the services, uh, including the ability to get paid. Uh, Masterbucks is our payment platform, which is getting some massive upgrades. Uh, the idea that you can essentially empower a cloud based wallet. Uh, that allows people to hold value and be able to utilize that value in a, in a no-fee, 24-7 way. Uh, these are fascinating components of a much larger agenda to empower people to be able to participate in a digital economy. Especially, and that's, and that's something that's important, uh, you know, especially with, with COVID uh, having rolled in on us. Um, you know, I was reminded of just a journey over to Chick-fil-A with my uh, family early on in this, it was probably about a week, the first week or so that I ventured over to Chick-fil-A, um, was told that the order was like $42. I went to hand, um, you know, the person a $50 bill and they were like, we can't accept that. And, right. you know, that kind of blew my mind for that, that moment. I was just like, man, who would have ever thought that a Chick-fil-A or any other type of business would say no to cash? I mean, that's just mind blowing. And so the work that you're doing in terms of coming to a contactless um, environment of payment, I mean, it, th that certainly seems to be something that is on the horizon, if not already here. Yeah, you know, you look at the stats uh, in the time from March to May, uh, e-commerce penetration in the U.S. doubled. Mm. Right? Now, people speculate that it will essentially drop off because the stores will open again. I'm not so convinced. I think you are going to see habits change permanently uh, because people will do more and more things online because it will become much more convenient to do so. Uh, when you go to look at a typical mall that is now reopened, many of them are operating with a skeleton crew uh, with reduced inventory. Uh, I, I don't know that we're going to see a really rapid restoration of the traditional models. And as for like the pattern of the world becoming more cashless, I think that was kind of baked in. Um, I'll spare you my, my theories about why that might be, but I think it is baked in that the world is going to become more cashless, but the actual implementation of that more cashless approach to transaction is still very much a wide open game. And there are a lot of contenders that are doing innovative things in different markets all around the world and in different industries uh, all around the world. 
And at this point, the, 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 the field is wide open. There is no uh, uh, predefined uh, winner-take-all scenario currently known for who will drive peer-to-peer -peer payments as a, as a worldwide standard. I imagine in the next three to five years, it will become obvious who that will be. But as of today, I would say still wide open. So then, Rob, in terms of COVID, uh, I know you discussed a little bit about it, but I mean, has it impacted, you know, what have been the pros and cons of COVID for, for Epic? Well, what we have seen was an immediate spike in the number of transactions in the $1,000 to kind of $10,000 uh, price point, uh, because many people uh, who were displaced were trying to figure out startups that they could start. And then there were people who had existing businesses that needed to develop online strategies right away. Uh, sole proprietorships and small businesses, they are, they are nimble. Uh, they don't need to go to an executive committee and basically do a, a three-year budget plan uh, to be able to make the decision to buy a, a, a five-figure domain. Uh, however, large corporations, uh, they tend to be relatively slow. Uh, they were still trying to figure out how to make sure everybody showed up to work when everybody was working remotely. They were still trying to figure out how to keep people from losing their minds because they were depressed, you know, or whatever, right? And so these problems uh, are uh, the primary kind of foundation building effort of, of moving to a decentralized workforce that the larger enterprises are still adapting to. But I think what you're going to find in the course of 2020, the various organizations that have access to vast amounts of capital are going to make bold decisions to retool for a digital world. I'll give you an example. Pepsi-Cola launched snacks.com. Now, if you come from the consumer package world, I spent nine years there at P&G, you would never disenfranchise the channel, right? The right. retail channel would not be a group for you to mess with. Well, if people can't get to the grocery store or they can't get to their local bodega or whatever, then what is going to be their alternative? And so you have people buying stuff by the case, by the pallet, whatever. And some of this stuff is high value to weight. Um, Bra.com, a concept that we're uh, uh, currently developing uh, for uh, purchase by a major player, um, is an example of a high value to weight category where you're simply buying a promise. Um, and that promise is actually depicted very well in, in the marketing of the Bra.com. If you go to Bra.com and watch the video trailer, it tells a story uh, that resonates with a, a woman who is contemplating to buy a bra. And I would say to you that there are going to be very bold moves by organizations. I won't name names, but they will, they will be positioning for a direct-to-consumer world. And this is a really big deal because take into consideration for a moment the vast amount of manufacturing capacity that now exists offshore in places like China. Totally. Uh, what would happen when a consumer is predominantly buying online and can't distinguish between the, the retail storefront where they are buying? Uh, it all of a sudden becomes very economic for the consumer to buy direct and to buy it even made for them, right? On demand, made for me, direct. Uh, if you look at Unilever that bought uh, dollar Shave Club for a billion dollars. Uh, that was an early example of direct-to-consumer. Uh, you would be able to tailor your product uh, to your particular you know, unique requirements, get on a subscription, and the product is brought to you. Well, think about all the women who currently are not able to maintain you know, cut and color at the regular stylist. You're having all these people who are basically getting on a regimen of, of self-coloring. So you have now uh, direct delivery, uh, as, you can, as you can see, because you and I are having video, I don't color my hair. I don't intend to ever try. <laughs> but there are people who are on the regular maintaining their dye job. Well, you know, guess what? Uh, now people are getting in the habit of trying it on their own. And, you know, we're in an environment where, you know, everybody can walk around with a bad haircut and it's all cool. But, you know, within three to six months, we might get good at it. And then all of a sudden, we'll be giving each other haircuts and uh, maintaining, uh, maintaining, you know, color or whatever. Um, and so think about what that means to uh, a salon industry that basically built itself around a service culture, uh, having to adapt to a world where direct-to-consumer, do it myself and do it for me, uh, you know, is, is able to be delivered uh, at the hyper-local level, right? 
delivered direct to you uh, in, in residence uh, with or without a, a service provider, right? Right. So I think so we're seeing really a becomes... massive trans transformation happening uh, where people are having to retool for a scenario where the consumer is going to do a lot more. Right. And so that really, I mean, it's, it's really like uh, what Amazon is to, you know, most modern day consumers now. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a backlash against Amazon. I mean, obviously Amazon is doing great uh, and, and hiring <laughs> a, you know, a pace, but there's also a huge amount of backlash right now. Amazon fresh, maybe sliding down, you know, the, the service ranking uh, Amazon disenfranchising the affiliates uh, with aggressive cutbacks on their uh, affiliate share. Exactly. Uh, at the time when people were trying to basically make ends meet uh, from losses of income. I mean, you couldn't ask for worse timing uh, for taking such a draconian action. And it wasn't like they didn't have access to cash. Right. So you know, what could possibly be going on there? I don't know exactly, but I don't think it was actually with a, with a long-term view towards human empowerment. Right. So people remember these things, right? If you don't demonstrate compassion, in an environment where people are losing their jobs and losing loved ones and, and, and are fearful, uh, then uh, I think you, that there will be a backlash. There will be a, a period where people will remember who had their back uh, in a time of trouble and who threw them under the bus in a time of totally. trouble. This is not the time for large enterprises with access to infinite free money from the Federal Reserve uh, to engage in draconian uh, winner-take-all exploitative action. This is a time to figure out how to co-create abundance. And uh, I wish more companies did that, but I think if they did, they would see their world transform. So then Rob, in terms of, in terms of cutting down, I guess really all the, the, the middle players there from brand to consumer, then how does such a play impact domain investors? Well, I think the big thing is that you're going to see a big uh, growth in uh, direct-to-consumer initiatives. I think brandable domains are a fascinating area. They have, you know, the best asymmetric returns, uh, where oftentimes, you know, five-letter na names can go for $100,000. And we see this all the time. Uh, many of these transactions are not being published. We don't publish our sales. Uh, we have occasionally announced transactions but our general approach is not to actually disclose sales. But I would say brandables are fantastic because they offer the ability to essentially take a combination of characters that are unique, uh, four character, five character, six character, um, are particularly interesting. Sometimes two word names are interesting. I sometimes see uh, the new TLDs being used where the, the SLD and the TLD uh, work together as, as a cohesive brand. Uh, these are all super interesting. And we're seeing an abundance of those types of domains being transacted because people are launching new ventures and they want to do it online in a way that maintains some brand distinctiveness. And so I think brandables are, are among the most interesting. Uh, we are working with a number of the brandable marketplaces. Uh, we have a cooperation with Squad Help, and we like those guys a lot. Uh, I wish those guys would increase their price points. Uh, where they weren't selling everything for a couple thousand dollars, right? Uh, and to allow these domains to stand alone so that you don't, you know, basically co get comparison shopped um, and, and, and where you have some discipline around uh, what the price point is. So, for example, Squad Help could take a policy that say, yeah, we accept your domain and the list price is going to be X. And then you have to make a decision. Do you agree to that list price or not? Uh, but if you actually had the ability to take... Uh, price points of brand, brandables where beauty is in the eye of the beholder uh, to a level where they can stand on their own and be evaluated by potential buyers for the strategic power that they represent, uh, I think you would see a very, very different outcome. One of the things that we really appreciate about our SSL landers, uh, we provide everybody with the ability to create a custom landing page with a unique SSL certificate on their uh, domain name, is that the domain name is like walking into an art gallery where the only painting on the wall is your painting, right? You've been in some of these galleries where you walk into the room and there's one painting in, in the entire room and that's it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can't really be distracted by all the shiny stuff that is, you know, on this corner or that corner or, or honey, look at this, right? That's not really happening because you have one painting to appreciate. And when you have a domain name that is on its own landing page with its own story, People can evaluate it through the lens of what does that particular brand do for me and not with much consideration for what are my available alternatives. 
uh, it's it's like you had me at hello, right? I mean, it's love at first sight, <laughs> right? And if you make an emotional connection with the with the buyer who is basically trying to make a rational decision, but the rational decision that is also governed by emotion, and so you have to imagine the 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 idea that when you're selling a brandable, you're selling a bit of a, a, a bit of a dream, right? Because it's what you imagine. It's not necessarily something that you can go to an appraisal engine and generate a number and get a number that actually makes any sense. But think about all the different brands that we encounter that are just a combination of strings or just a combination of letters and what they have become. Uh, Novi, the, 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 the topic of the day, right? right? All these Novi domains that are being registered, you know, fourcharacter.com. So then for our listeners that aren't familiar with Novi, then Rob, explain a bit about Novi. Well, I mean, it's, it's one of many crypto projects that are going to be on, uh, you know, rolled out, right, in the coming years. Uh, the point is, as the world becomes progressively more digital, you'll see lots of innovative new business models being trotted out by both uh, startups, but also by very well-capitalized organizations. And what was previously going to be Libra, I guess, is going to be called Novi. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that project. Um, and I think that people who are you know, participating in uh, some of these on-trend domain registration categories, uh, some of them will do great. You know, when, when, uh, when uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, and Grimes named name, name their kid, everybody was trying to get these names of this unpronounceable uh, string of characters for, <laughs> for their newborn. I mean, I mean, people get on these trends and you have to step back and say, okay, is that a sustainable trend or is that a flash in the pan? Uh, yeah. And I think there are um, uh, sustainable trends around things like optimal health um, that, are, that are relevant, whereas, let's say, you know, corona is here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, and I, I don't say that it's a flash in the pan. I think it's probably with us for six to 12 months. But there, there is a shelf life uh, for how much longer those names will be needed to empower certain projects. So you either uh, participate and unload those domains or you move on. Whereas brandables, you know, there's a finite number of combinations of five character strings that are pronounceable and that are, that are capable of being trademarked. And so their staying power of those names. So I really like uh, the, the four and five character uh, brandable names. I think you can get way more asymmetric return on those than you will get from say a two or three character because there's intrinsic value from a rarity standpoint. Uh, of a two or three character uh, uh, .com. But when you get into the fours and the fives and the sixes, now it's much more of uh, uh, staying power, beauty in the eye of the beholder, and, and especially doing your homework as to who is the party that is inquiring about your domain name. One of the unique things about Epic is that we give you all the details about the registrant who is inquiring about that domain name so you can make an informed decision. Are you dealing with a bootstrap startup or are you dealing with an organization that might have significant means and and knowing then whether you should present a lease uh, to a bootstrap entrepreneur or whether to present a six or even seven figure scenario to an organization that can afford it so interesting so then what information i guess what information is revealed well uh email address uh first name last name um uh, i p address uh including the ability to reverse look up that i p address uh to know where that party is coming from uh and then whatever notes that came along with the inquiry so uh, many times you'll hear some context and sometimes it's some sap story about i'm a starving student whatever <laughs> uh and then you have to kind of evaluate whether that's actually what this is about. Uh, or whether you're being, uh, you know, deceived with somebody trying to get the upper hand in the negotiation, but you can do that, right? And um, by essentially, whether you reply directly via email, which we allow, or whether you use our free CRM tools, you can essentially, uh, you know, decide whether you're going to reply in a in an anonymous way. Let's say that you are concerned about revealing your identity, then you can just do that through our free CRM tools. And all of the communication that happens between you and the prospective buyer is captured in the free CRM tools. Uh, but if you prefer to go offline and, and pick up the phone and, and, and call that party and try to suss them out because you're good on phone, great, uh, we, we empower that. And of course, that means that we might get cut out on some commissions, 
uh, by people who just uh, take us out of the equation. And, and, and that's, of course, unfortunate on some level. But on the other hand, if they make a big sale and they have a windfall and they can now redeploy that windfall into buying other names and, and building their domain empire, then we, we might win down the road. And so you, you have to balance the decision about short-term uh, uh, margin capture from long-term value creation and participating in that value. Um, we have customers we have worked with and are working with who've had six, seven figure transactions that partly were made possible because they had the benefit of a full picture as to who were they dealing with during the early part of that negotiation. And um, when people see that they have the ability to basically negotiate from a position of asymmetric knowledge where they're not at a disadvantage, uh, you get a very different outcome. And, you know, people are, people are appreciative of that. You know, they may not realize how important it is until they see a seven-figure transaction that would have otherwise not happened. Certainly, certainly. And I know that that's one of the things that if you ask most domain investors, it is the ability to see who is inquiring and how much information. And, and for the most part, uh, what it sounds like is like Epic is pulling all of that information into a single pane of glass versus having to go out and, you know, um, you know, procure or, you know, curate rather all of those different details, if it's even possible. Yeah, I think we're going to do more and more stuff related to kind of aggregated analytics, uh, like I mentioned about the ability to know how many offers this particular party has made, uh, what their close rate has been, um, and any other details that might be knowable about that particular IP address. Uh, we have access to pretty interesting databases for being able to reverse look up what, uh, it, what information is associated with that IP address and also what the risk assessment is associated with that IP address. So by using those types of analytic tools, we could give a potential seller a lot more intelligence, but even go so far as to introducing uh, uh, intelligent auto-responding. So you know, dealing with things like 24-7, uh, uh, re-engaging or engaging for the first time with a prospective buyer and being able to kind of move them along in the purchase decision without even necessarily having to be involved in it in real time, right? Uh, that's a game changer because, you know, people who have large portfolios where they're getting 50 or 100 offers a day, um, they may be in the midst of a, of a conversation or they may be at a three-hour appointment, whatever, uh, and, and then who's tending to their leads? Now, somebody sends an inquiry uh, and, and they're maybe looking at five or 10 different domains. Uh, if you are the first to basically engage them so they know there's a person on the other end, they may take a pause and instead of working on two or three more inquiries, they're now reading your email and taking time to reply to your email or they're doing some due diligence as to who is it that is trying to sell me this to me, right? So that's actually one of the uh, main reasons why we've put such a significant emphasis on building smart CRM. Then in terms of kind of wrapping up here, like you've mentioned so many things in terms of what's to come down, the, you know, the pipe for, for Epic. Now, what do you see on the horizon for the domain industry as a whole, you know, as we look at the second half of 2020? Well, I think you're going to see the corporates uh, starting to basically open up their war chests because they have now kind of weathered the immediate storm of the COVID crisis and uh, they're starting to figure out how to basically retool. So I think you're going to see a, a, a very big uptick uh, in, in corporate spend uh, on digital retooling. This bodes very well for people who have development grade domain names. I think you will also see uh, a, a much more disciplined approach towards uh, monetizing uh, um, uh, expiry streams. You're going to see people waking up to the possibility that even the, the option of selling a name for $9 uh, that you would have otherwise gotten zero, if that means that you can renew a name that you would have otherwise dropped, and that name that you didn't drop then turns around and it gets sold for whatever, four, five, six figures, some life transforming outcome, you never know, right? You right. never know the, 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 the marginal cost and the marginal benefit consequence of that one extra name that you basically allowed to drop. Um, and so the guy who let Novi.com you know, uh, uh, drop uh, you know, 10 years ago, because he probably did, he's kicking himself. <laughs> I used to own that name. 
right? <laughs> right? You know, and of course we we laugh right now because you know now four L that four L pronounceable dot coms are very rare, but there was a point in time when they weren't. Right. Oh man, that, that is that is correct. You know, it's it, it could have been a yeah, and I think about you know, and I think about some of those domains that I go, oh shoot, man, had I known about Name Liquidate or had it been you know in place prior to two thousand nineteen, then it it's one of those things that, like you said, looking back, it is you know one of those uh, moments. Um, but I, I but I'm certain that you know you all are probably capitalizing um, well because I, I hear people, see people tweet about it, talk about it. And so it is something that is uh, this liquidation platform is something that is definitely kind of the talk of the town for the domain industry. Well, we're excited about that uh, for for two reasons. Number one, it solves a problem. But number two, it actually begins to illustrate the power of ecosystems. So the idea right. we can now take uh, you know, problems that need to be solved, solve them, and then people will try them because they see Epic has a world-class registrar. We're actually a really capable host. And we also launch useful products. And the historical approach that we have taken of a bit of crawl, walk, run, where we were relatively experimental, uh, has, has transitioned. I mean, now that we were named Registrar of the Year, uh, people hold us to a different standard. If we're not perfect, they let us know. Um, and and uh, the standard of, of, of operational excellence uh, across um, service and product um, is a different standard. And they no longer hold us to a standard of um, better than whoever, no names. They hold us to a standard of better or, or not as good as it could be, right? They hold us to a standard of perfection. And we actually invite that. We actually tell our customers to keep the bar, bar high. I often thank customers who find some you know, product or service issue and they direct our attention to it uh, rather than you know, bemoan the fact that we have to deal with this problem. I rather embrace it and acknowledge that customer. We even pay bug bounties uh, to people for giving feature suggestions or identifying some usability issue uh, or, or finding an outright problem uh, to encourage people to uh, co-create, but also to turn uh, something that maybe fell short to something that exceeded expectations. Now you hit on something uh, in terms of bug bounty and just a whole new feature. And one of the things that, you know, I just kind of see on the horizon and I've, I've heard stories, I've seen things happen. And I know that from an account standpoint, you can add additional account managers, but to a certain extent, I, I kind of look and I go with the domain um, investing industry or the domain industry in itself aging. Like I start looking and thinking about estate planning and sure. will there be a, you know, um, service that focuses on what happens. I know it's a bit tricky in terms of all the legalities, but will there ever be a service that's provided by um, a registrar that really focuses in and hones in on uh, what's going on with domain estate planning and domain investors sometimes dying and domains sure. are expiring and no sure. one knows about it. They're next to kin, you know, sure. doesn't know about it. So yeah. uh, that's one of the things that I, I know that I, as I look towards the horizon, I'm like, man, this is something that certainly has to be solved. Yeah. Well, we have a service. If you go to epic.com, so epik.com slash manage, uh, it will take you right to a page uh, that is basically for that scenario, which is for the scenario where you want to basically set up uh, a set of policies around how your portfolio is to be dispositioned, uh, both from a, a living will standpoint, right? So the day-to-day -day operation of who's going to vet my inquiries, uh, to who's authorized to basically manage my account in the event of my passing or incapacitation, uh, and and what is the triggering event that will have to happen in order for that change of stewardship to occur? Right. So those things are individually negotiated, individually documented, and then we apply them. And we actually don't charge a fee for that. We actually do that as a uh, as a professional courtesy. Uh, but if you go to epic.com/manage, it'll walk you through. Uh, why we do that and how we do it. That is amazing. That is amazing. Well, I mean, definitely our time is growing short. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with listeners? Well, I would say uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, so twitter.com slash epic.com, D-O-T-C-O-M. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash Rob Monster. 
Um, we're uh, pretty active there. Um, we have historically also been active on name pros, but I would say from the standpoint of the really pithy stuff uh, and the exciting stuff that is uh, worth uh, noting, uh, Twitter is a pretty effective way for us to get the message out. Uh, we also have uh, a, a Facebook, uh, but I would say uh, definitely follow us on Twitter. And I, I would uh, invite you to um, uh, reach out and, and get to know us. Uh, one of the things that is exciting about uh, being in this industry um, is that uh, we try to be a relationship-based organization where we know our customer. Uh, so if you have a portfolio with us or you're thinking about setting up a portfolio with us, uh, say hello, uh, and, and we'll do our best to make time uh, to get acquainted and to be uh, cognizant of whatever your u unique requirements are. That's great. So you, everybody, you, you, you heard it there from uh, Rob Monster, CEO of Epic. So, you know, with that, we're out of time. But Rob, thank you again for joining us today and sharing your entrepreneurial journey and sharing all that Epic is doing to empower digital users. It's been my pleasure, Alvin. Thanks for the show. Certainly, and thank you listeners for tuning in into Kickstart Commerce, where we share search marketing and domain name strategies to help grow your business. Please subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or Podbean. Last but not least, please visit kickstartcommerce.com to subscribe to the newsletter sharing tips and tricks about the disciplines of digital strategy. Thanks, and that's all for now.